Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this session. This is part of an ongoing series relating to accessibility that eCampus Ontario has been offering. You'll see that there's another session that's taking place tomorrow. All of these sessions are being recorded and will be available on YouTube. And many of the sessions, the facilitators have developed a companion OER as well, which will be available in the Open Library Collection. Before we begin this session, I would like to take a moment to share a land acknowledgement. The campuses the offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I am joining you today from Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people of Turtle Island, the Atikamasheng, the Anishinaabek, and I would also like to recognize the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Sarah has shared um, some information in the chat, links to land acknowledgements and other information, but please feel free to take the opportunity to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Thank you. And now I am going to pass our presentation over to our facilitator for today, Jen Booth, and I'm going to be advancing the deck for her. So here we go. Thanks, Laura. I think my biggest challenge today is going to be not trying to use the mouse and keyboard that are not attached to the laptop that I am currently using. So I've just moved them out and I think we are ready to go. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jen Booth. I'm an OER librarian and I do a lot of work with uh, faculty around uh, working on accessibility in their OER projects. So here to share some of that today and uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion coming out of this. Um, so we weren't quite sure what to call this uh, particular session, so I went with how accessible is this? Um, I find that as I speak with faculty and I work with fac faculty in OER development, um, there's just a lot of questions. So we're going to start with that question, how accessible is this? And um, let's let's go. We'll get to the next slide. Thanks, Laura. Um, so just a very, I, I feel like this week with all of the sessions that have been going on, uh, people are becoming more aware uh, as the days progress, but just a really quick recap over what is AODA. So AODA stands for Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, okay? It's, you can find the link in the slides. Um, you can also Google it. And this lengthy document sets accessibility standards for a variety of different things, okay? And that includes physical spaces, um, customer service, digital web content and learning materials, and more. Okay, so today we're gonna focus specifically on uh, web-based open educational resources. Um, but I imagine as we work through this, you will probably be seeing some parallels and some lines out to other types of course materials um, and things that you're preparing for um, education roles. So let's go to the next slide. Again, just a little bit of an introduction. Why does AODA compliance matter? Okay, so number one, it's the law, okay? It supports universal design for learning, okay? But most importantly to me, it removes barriers and it improves engagement with our students and it helps us to be proactive, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these things as we work through. That's just kind of my, my little mini lesson leading in. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right, I think it's also important to have a little bit of a, a discussion about what can affect accessibility. So um, in, in a post-secondary education context, we have, um, we have a lot of different things going on, right? We have physical accessibility issues in our buildings. Uh, we have digital accessibility issues with the software that we pick, that type of thing. Um, but accessibility extends beyond just um, students that may have an academic accommodation. So um, if you teach regularly, you may get uh, accommodation letters from your accessibility department that tell you that particular students need particular things in order to um, make their learning more equitable. And accessibility can be affected, not just those official accommodations, but it can be affected by day-to-day -day life or current events. Um, it can be affected by digital literacy, right? If a student is not uh, super savvy, and maybe hasn't taken an online class before, um, they may have accessibility issues with the way content is laid out. 
access to technology can also affect accessibility, right? Um, I think we a lot of us learned this during the pandemic, if you were teaching in that context. Um, I know at my college, we had students who were driving to the parking lots of our buildings and sitting there to access uh, stable internet, okay? Um, the structure of information and the presentation of information can also affect accessibility. So accessibility is not necessarily a static thing. Uh, you know, if you think of someone who um, is having sickness issues and maybe someone who can't, you know, their internet's down, my computer died right before the presentation, right? There's all kinds of different things that affect people's accessibility um, and the accessibility of the content that you create. And then another really big kind of takeaway that from the work that I've been doing around accessibility is that content that is on the web can be technically accessible, as in it, it checks the boxes on a checklist, but it may still actually have significant barriers. And so this little graphic on this page um, talks about usability and user experience, right? Um, and the idea that we can, um, we can create things that we feel are accessible and we've, we've added our alt text, we've done some of those checks and balances, um, but there can still be barriers. Um, some of those won't, will be out of our control. Some of them are things that um, maybe we just missed. So just some key pieces to keep in mind as we, as we work through this material. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Laura. So another sort of important thing that I talk about a lot when I speak with faculty is why it's important to start accessible. So we have that option as we're creating content, as we're creating course materials, as we're creating open education resources. Um, we have the opportunity to consider accessibility at the beginning. And I would, I would like to suggest that, that is always the best approach if you can. Um, if we're thinking about accessibility from the start, we are stepping towards universal design for learning. Um, no one wants to have, no one wants to find out in week three or four that the majority of the content in their course is inaccessible to several students in their class. Um, no one wants to find out at the end of the semester that you had students that couldn't access the textbook because the platform that, um, that it was, that that digital textbook was on uh, wasn't accessible to people in different countries, right? So avoiding those mid-semester issues, I think is a good proactive thing. Um, it is also the law to offer accessible materials. So we have to get our minds around that. And for me, it's really important to try to proactively meet student needs. So it doesn't mean that everything that you create is going to be perfectly accessible, um, but if we're always working towards that and we're trying to start off accessible and give some thought to um, the resources that we're selecting, that's gonna be really helpful in terms of, of actually moving us, ourselves along. And then another key takeaway, most platforms are only as accessible as the content that you add into them. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as this presentation progresses, um, but, but that's a big one as well. Okay, so the example for that is this little image, and this is um, supposed to be a graphic of a, a hotspot. And hotspots are cool little interactive activities that we can add into our course presentations. However, they are almost never accessible. <laughs> they, even if you provide alt text, um, it's very difficult if someone has uh, vision loss or is unable to see this image for whatever reason. There's, it's very difficult for them to, to use that. Um, it's just not a format that's accessible. So. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So at this point, I'm gonna pause here and we're gonna take it to the chat. And I want you to do some thinking about how accessible our current course materials are. So you can think about your OER, if you have an OER, um, think about the things that you post inside your content management system, um, stuff like that. So take a look at this sort of spectrum and I will suggest that it's a spectrum. And at the beginning of it, we have resources that are built for some audiences. In the middle of the spectrum, we have uh, resources that are accessible to many and might be technically accessible. And then towards the end of the, the one side of the spectrum, we have things that are fully accessible and inclusive. So I want you to take a minute and I'll pause and think about something that you use in your course and throw into the chat. How accessible do you think that actually is?
I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm going to continue on, but please feel free to throw something in there as you're listening. So when we think about course materials in general, um, I think of like a traditional textbook. How accessible is a traditional textbook? Unfortunately, a traditional textbook, a printed textbook, is actually not really accessible to that many people. Um, so it would be on the left-hand side of the spectrum where it's built for some audiences. Okay. And um, thanks, Laura. And when we think of ebooks, okay, are ebooks accessible? Right. Actually, it depends. It depends on the platform that they're posted on, right? So ebooks might be a little bit more accessible because they're digital first. Um, and that might land them in the accessible to many or the technically accessible area. What about OER? So OER, again, really can vary depending on um, how the content was created, what work they did to make the, uh, the items accessible. I see there's a note from Laura saying that Leo from the Open Library developed Mastering Open Ad, which is an, uh, an OER textbook. And it was bilingual by design and it went through an accessibility review. Right? So that one is probably going to fall somewhere on the spectrum closer to fully accessible, um, so somewhere in between. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Uh, thank you. We've got the link there if anybody wants to check it. So the idea that um, our current course materials, honestly, um, yes, sometimes licensing can make it complicated to remediate for OER too. Thanks, Mary. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, so Thinking about our current course materials, some of those traditional things that we would be using, ebooks and, and printed textbooks, um, probably not really all that accessible. Um, thinking about OER, a lot of the OER content that you find is going to be probably technically accessible. It'll be better than, for example, um, an ebook that's locked behind a specific system that we don't really know what's going on there. Um, but it is a spectrum. And so we're always moving towards trying to make our OER more accessible, trying to, to add improvements. Um, but there, there's a lot going on there. So that's kind of the point of this, uh, this particular presentation is to work through that. And the truth of the matter is, it's hard to imagine a scenario when an open textbook is going to be fully inclusive, because there's just so many different needs out there. But as long as I think we're working towards making things more and more accessible, um, as we're, I think that's, that's a really positive step. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, and then this is the, the follow-up question is, but isn't it already accessible? Unfortunately, in the OER world, it's not already accessible. Um, it, again, it's a spectrum. It depends on where the source was created. Um, if it has traveled from one particular platform, let's say it was an OpenStax textbook, probably really uh, technically accessible at least, in OpenStax, but let's say we decided to move it into Pressbooks, right? There can be accessibility issues that are introduced um, in that process because features can be lost. So sometimes when we do the import, um, alt text or captions, footnotes, that type of thing, they don't necessarily translate nicely between the different systems. And so if you're not taking the time to review and double check that those features haven't been lost, we could be introducing some barriers into the materials that we're doing, that we're using. Um, and then, of course, I'm sure all of you have encountered older content on the web. So, you know, uh, OER that were created five, 10 years ago, right, may have been created to different accessibility standards. Um, different places, so different geography has different standards. Canada and the U.S. is, is similar, uh, but there may be some, some slightly different pieces. Uh, I know there is specifically around video accessibility between Canada and the U.S., and then, of course, our subject specialists, those great people that are putting all the love and effort into creating these OER, their knowledge varies, right? So they may not necessarily know about all of the different pieces. Um, so bad news is we can't change re regular web content, but we can typically change or improve OER content as long as, as Mary notes, the licensing on that item allows for it. So that's kind of a good news piece. Um, so it's kind of a caution. No, it probably isn't already accessible, but we do have that opportunity as we work on OER to improve it. So it's not all bad news, it's just we still have work to do. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so 
If you've done any searching out on the web or you've looked through, um, eCampus just released some great new resources around accessibility. You will probably find that um, they are huge and they are overwhelming. And so what I try to do when I work with faculty around OER projects is I've tried to parse this down into sort of a top five list of things that we should be looking for. Um, so this list is gonna look a little different than the other ones that you've seen because I've tried to group them kind of thematically to make it seem a little bit less overwhelming. So we're gonna spend a few minutes and go through the top five issues. And then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about um, OER projects and, and what approaches we can take to improving those. Okay, so top five issues, we're gonna talk about text equivalence. We're gonna talk about descriptive links and labeling, the careful use of image and colors, page and document structure, and then some notes on platform and software specific issues. So if you don't mind, Laura, just throw up that next slide for us. Awesome. Okay, so text versions of visual content. Most people are familiar with the idea that if we put in an image, we need to put it in alt text, and that is a great start. Um, but we really should be considering images, videos, and interactive activities like H5P. So I've got an image here on the screen. I should look at this image when I'm, when I'm looking at web content and say, hey, is this image conveying meaning? Yes, it is. Okay, so then I need to make sure I am providing an appropriate alt text for that particular image. When it comes to interactive activities like H5P, again, classic example of things that can be technically accessible, but may actually still have a number of barriers. Um, so traditional screen reading tools can handle a number of the H5P activities, but some of the newer tools that I find my students are using, um, just they're, they're actually reading tools as opposed to a, an official screen reader. And when I take H5P and I put those inside my learning management system, because of course I'm gonna do that, if I find a great H5P, I'm gonna be like, hey, OER world, I'm taking this, I'm gonna put it in my course um, with proper attribution, of course. But when I do that, layering an H5P inside um, a course management system can actually render the H5P really not useful. To students, okay? So we need to think about visual content in general. When you're looking at visual content on the web, do some thinking. Does it have it at all text? Um, yes, Laura's just mentioning browser read aloud tools as well. Again, great tool doesn't necessarily work the same way as a screen reader. So um, when we're seeing visual things in general, we should be asking ourselves, are there accurate text-based alternatives? So this could be captions on videos, super, super important. Transcripts are also great. Alt text or image description. So sometimes an image, um, and we'll see this in a minute, but sometimes an image can be quite complex and it actually makes sense to bring the image description out from behind the alt text, which only screen readers can access and put it somewhere where everybody can benefit from that. And then um, I always love to see text versions of H5P activities or other interactive activities just to um, help make sure that everybody has an equivalent experience with that content. Okay, so let's go to number two. Beautiful, okay. Descriptive links and labeling. So this is what I'm still encountering. Um, I think people are becoming more aware of it, but we still have that bad habit, that click here habit. Click here to read all about the TTC subway line. Um, that type of thing. So when you are looking at web content, we're looking to see if descriptive links have been used. So you can see an example underneath my image it says link text by SEO ability is licensed under and then the license, right? Those are descriptive links. They are actually like words that point to what you're going to see if you go to that link. That's the big one. Um, watching for all caps, right? So um, People, some, people have that habit of sometimes making headings all capital letters, that type of thing. It can be a little problematic from an accessibility standpoint because the letters are boxy instead of having like a distinct shape. Um, so that's, that's a bit of an issue. Um, I love to see links in HTML uh, files, so in your press books, in your, your different web resources um, that are marked. So if that link is not just, it's going to do something different like open Adobe Acrobat or open Microsoft Word, 
we should we should label them so it just says like pdf after it that gives um some systems will actually put a little icon in for you pressbooks doesn't currently but um that can be really helpful and again if the link is going to open in a new tab you won't be able to go back right so letting people that are using assistive tech know new tab gives them an idea of what's going to happen when they click that link and then along with the descriptive links i love to see some labeling in oer materials so for example, if you've got an image, um, you can put in alt text, but putting a caption or an introduction to the image, the video, the H5P activity, all of those things can help to improve um, to improve that experience for people that may be using some reading tools or, or something else. I do see one note um, in the chat that one problem is that people sometimes confuse text to speech tools with screen readers. Exactly. And they do function differently. I kind of did a deep dive of this um, because I thought all the stuff I had in Blackboard Ultra was accessible until I realized that my students are not using screen readers and the way it was set up in there, the, the text to speech tools were not reading that stuff properly. So yeah, there's a lot to kind of think about there for sure. And then of course, underlying text, don't use it unless there's a link because that's super confusing. That convention that we've all come to know, and I don't know whether we love it or not, but that convention that we've all come to know that underlying text is a link. You can have users trying to click things that are underlined that obviously aren't doing anything. Okay, so that's descriptive links and labeling, number two on my list. If you could go forward, please, Laura. Number three, careful use of colors and images. This one is nice because when you get into the right mindset, this one is really easy to pick out visually without much um, much help. So we have to watch for and consider color contrast, right? Black text on a dark red slide, not a good contrast. And there are different tools you can use to help you um, discern those, but that's a really nice, easy visual. If you're looking at something and your eyes are kind of squinting and you're going, I don't know, I, it's a little hard to see, probably a color contrast problem. The other major issue that we have with color and images is using both of them to convey meaning when they may not really be actually all that accessible to a number of your users, okay? So there's an example on the right-hand side of the slide here, um, and it's two subway maps, okay? I know it's a little hard to see, but I'll just, so I'll just describe it. Um, in the, on the first side, or the, the, the one side, we have a subway map that is, has color showing the different lines, okay? And for someone who, has um, a visual visual issue with color, they may not be able to see those lines. They may not be able to tell them apart, right? And that can happen also when you make, make the colors very similar colors. Um, on the other side of the diagram, we have the same subway map, but instead of just conveying the meaning with color, we've added in an icon. And that will help to discern if, you know, like even some screens, right? If my laptop's on the fritz, it can sometimes the color doesn't display the way it's supposed to. So it's really good to make sure that you're not using color alone to convey meaning. And the same thing with images, right? In complex images and charts, sometimes we see in OER, um, the alt text, something like accessible infographic, right? Except there's a lot of meaning being conveyed by that infographic. And in fact, the the alt text for this infographic is a good, good paragraph to try to explain all of this. So it doesn't mean that we can't use these visually appealing things, just that we should be looking to make sure that we're using them in a meaningful way and that if there's any sort of ambiguity, we would go in and add in some alt text or add a note underneath it. Another one that I've encountered a lot in OER is um, if you're using like a, like a writing OER, Sometimes we'll use, um, like we'll make words red to indicate that we're gonna edit those out. And that editing thing can be really problematic. Um, so what do you do? Well, you can put a little text underneath to say, the edited words were these things, right? So there's lots that you can do. Um, and like I said, this one is, like I said, once you get used to looking for it, um, it it'll start to jump out at you. Okay, so let's go to number four. Page and document structure. Okay, this particular issue is a pretty significant one and it is a lot harder to detect. So in the case of screen readers, they absolutely need you 
to use proper headings as opposed to making something bold and 10 point or bold and 14 point, we need to use the functions within whatever software we're using, right? So in Pressbooks, you can declare an H1 heading, an H2 heading, and they should be properly nested because they help the screen reader to navigate that page properly, right? Um, but the catch is we can't think only about web content. We also have to think about any ancillary materials or any sort of attachment. So a Word file, um, a PDF, a PowerPoint, anything like that. So we need to make sure it's done properly on the web and then in any files that we might have our students open or download. Um, so headings really help to provide document structure. You can do headings in Word, you can do them in PowerPoint, you can do them in um, Pressbooks. And they do provide, um, they do provide a good consistent look and feel once you have them set up properly. But I will say it's been a journey to get myself to stop making all the headings in my Word documents 18 point calibre bold because that was just something that I always did. Instead, I had to go and make them in H1 and then do a little word magic um, so that now my word is set that all H1s should be Calibri 18 font bold, right? Um, so it makes a huge difference. And you will see this a lot in OER material, but you won't necessarily be able to see it. You do need to use a tool. And one that I love is free and you can install it as a browser add-in is the Wave tool. And I see Laura has just put the Wave tool link in the chat, thank you. Um, and then, when you're working in a particular software, you should be looking to see what tools do they have and use those built-in tools to assign the headings, but don't assume. Always need to double check before you publish anything, that type of thing. And so when I check OER materials for accessibility, this is often one of those things that like, it's a really quick, you just click the wave tool and it marks up the whole page for you. And it's really obvious when there are problems with the, the, the page and document structure. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's actually super simple and it will add structure to pretty much any type of file that you create. So totally recommend that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So last thing on my list, my top five, is around platform and software specific issues. And though this is certainly not, um, not completely comprehensive, but it's just to give you some ideas. When we look at different platforms, um, we only have so much control about the way that Pressbooks does things or about the way that Microsoft Office does things. Um, even Adobe PDF is actually super difficult to deal with from an accessibility perspective. So some of the things that we need to be aware of when you are looking at an OER that's created in Pressbooks, and I feel like the eCampus Ontario Library has lots of great OER now. We are starting to get that familiar look and feel of a Pressbook. Um, Absolutely, the first thing you should look is to see whether or not they have done what they needed to do about page structure, because it's a super easy thing to do, but it's also super easy to miss in Pressbooks, okay? Pressbooks also will allow you to kind of do things with the page structure that you shouldn't. Um, so all pages should start with an H1, but Pressbooks itself uses that. And um, so when you add your content into Pressbooks, you should always start with H2 and just go from there down. Um, a few of the common Pressbooks themes have some accessibility issues in them. Um, again, if you're looking at Pressbooks that someone else has created, you're not going to be able to do much about this unless you create your own and you clone that material, um, but it's just something to watch for. Uh, there's two themes that, I can't remember the second one, but the first one is Malala, and that one is, is considered to be decent for accessibility, and the eCampus Pressbooks server automatically defaults to that when you create a new book. So that's a helpful, helpful thing. In Pressbooks, the creators of OER have very little control over PDF output. So basically, as much as I hate to say it, you can never assume that that PDF is going to be accessible unless you have someone who's really, really knowledgeable in CSS and can do things that I can't. Um, it's going to be difficult. There's a lot of variables about what you put into Pressbooks and Pressbooks currently has no accessibility checker. So there's nothing going on in the background to tell you if you've introduced some problems. Now, very quick note, I was working with uh, the main Pressbooks people yesterday and they are working on putting an accessibility checker in it. They're at the testing phase. Um, so hopefully in the future, in your future, we will have uh, something that can help us there. So Pressbooks, again, reasonably accessible, but remember, 
um, 100% Pressbooks is only as accessible as the content that you add into it or that the creator of the OER has added into it. In H5P, um, we have, as I mentioned with the uh, image hotspot slide at the beginning, some types of H5P are just not accessible. Okay, Screen readers can get caught in H5P activities. Um, they can sort of navigate them. Sometimes it works better, um, but the reading tools don't seem to do much with H5P. So that's another thing to kind of think about. Um, another sort of side thing that I noticed is with H5P, when it's inside a press book, um, and actually even if it's just standing by itself, uh, it's very difficult for users to copy and paste or save the information in an H5P. And there is no accessibility checker on the H5P system as well. So just some things to think about. Um, when you are, are looking at H5P that you want to use in your course, consider offering a text version. Um, take a look at it. Make sure it's using a, a, an, an activity source that is accessible to start with. Um, that can help a lot. And then just for comparison, because I don't want to sound like I'm saying all OER are not accessible, Microsoft Office and Adobe PDF have their own problems. Um, when you create a document in Office that is accessible, it doesn't necessarily translate to whatever format you might save or export it into. So many variables. There's a great accessibility tool within Microsoft Office. Um, it doesn't cover everything, but it will, it'll get you started. Adobe PDF is another whole problem. Um, unless you have Acrobat Pro, so the, the expensive paid version of Acrobat, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to make an Acrobat PDF document fully accessible. You can get it to a point where it's readable, which is better, like it moves us along the spectrum. It's better than nothing, um, but it's not great, okay? And if you happen to have an Adobe PDF or, or a PDF that, for example, is a scanned PDF, like it's an image, very, very difficult to remediate. And Acrobat itself can be really challenging. Um, even files that start off digital, you can have trouble trying to make them um, do what they need to. So the accessibility tools in, in Adobe Acrobat. They do require a significant amount of background knowledge and just playing around with it and learning those skills um, to make it effective. Okay, so that's my big five. Let's go to the next slide. So what are some best practices? What are we gonna do with all of this information? If you are adopting OERs, so you are selecting, you're finding and selecting and you're going to adopt and use them in your course materials or you're gonna help someone else to do so, absolutely do some reading, raise your awareness, and dedicate some time to review those resources before you adopt them, okay? So I think it's a, for me, it's a, the more you know, the better, right? So learn a little bit about it, review them. Um, check to see if the, if the source has an accessibility statement. So this is something that, um, I know there was a session on this, I think last week, about uh, what should those accessibility statements have in them, and they can give you some clues as to how accessible the, the source is. So that's a great thing. Um, absolutely use web tools and local resources to assist. So um, it depends on, on your institution, who those resources are. Sometimes it's within the library, sometimes it's accessibility, sometimes it's adaptive technologists. But if you're considering something and you're not sure whether or not it's gonna work for most of your students, they would be a great place to start. And then if you find that a source is really um, lacking in accessibility features, you might need to go out and find something different or get yourself into a place where you might be able to adapt that resource, um, license willing, okay? So that's kind of my, my rough process for OER adoptions is learn about it, review those sources, right? If you happen to be in a role where you're helping other people find OER, you can kind of do a little bit of accessibility detective work before you recommend it so that everybody's really aware of what's going on with that particular resource. Um, and then proactively, you have a few things that you can do. If, um, for example, you find H5P activities that uh, you want to use within your course management system, but they're not really all that accessible, take a look at the license. Perhaps you can create the text version that you post with it, and that will just help to improve accessibility for everybody. OK, so next slide. So best practices around creating and adapting OER. It's kind of the same cycle, but raise your awareness, 
identify those issues before you start editing, especially if you have a team, right? Getting everybody to be aware of some of the deficiencies in the book will help you to kind of tackle, come up with a plan to tackle those. Um, you may, in some situations, need to identify content alternatives, options, or modify or create something um, to kind of bridge the, the accessibility issues. Um, I love the idea of developing a roadmap. So if you find a great OER, but it has some accessibility problems, right, and you, you're not in a position to adapt it right away, like come up with a roadmap, have a plan, right? If you know what those issues are, it's going to be significantly easier to put the, the work in to identify like when you could work on those, how could you improve them, who might be your resources. And then this is a really, really, really big one for me. Um, have someone audit your OER before you publish it. Okay, so in this case, if you're the person creating or if you're on the team that's creating that OER, you have the ability to put a little bit of time into that. You can have someone audit as you go, have someone do it at the end and just fix any outlying problems, that type of thing. Um, but having someone not right in the middle of the project take a look at it can be really, really helpful. And I find that with this process, um, we are able to identify and fix a lot of things that are like actually pretty easy to fix, right? As long as you know before you publish. Um, and then that, again, will move your resource along that spectrum to, um, you know, away from accessible only to a few to um, some of those, those better places along the spectrum. And then again, with your roadmap, as you revise the material, each time I like to try to go through and do a quick AODA check, um, see if there's anything else that I can um, that I can improve each time we do an edit. So that's kind of best practices there. Uh, do we have any more slides? I don't know how many more there are. Okay, so some tools to help you get started. Uh, we're not gonna have time to go into these in depth. Um, but uh, Laura put the WAVE uh, tool in and it is super easy to use. So really, really recommend that. Um, the WAVE accessibility check will check for text equivalents. It'll identify if you've got underlining where it should be. It will check if a link isn't has doesn't have a descriptive link. Um, it'll tell you about page and document structure and it can identify some minor color contrast issues as well. So it's a great place to start. It's super easy, but it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit fascinating. So you might find once you install it, you find yourself clicking on it on more pages than you probably should be because you just wonder, right? Once you know, you know. Um, so I love that tool. Uh, within our, thanks Laura, within our uh, software specific things, I, Adobe Acrobat Pro has a whole suite of accessibility tools that you can play around with. Um, but even if you're not there, starting to run that accessibility checker as you save an, a Microsoft Office document is a really good way to get yourself in the habit. Of, uh, of starting to address some of those issues. And then there are some cool color contrast tools that you can use uh, for image contrast, background and text colors. And um, don't forget that automated tools can only take you so far. There does need to be some humor in human intervention. And even though it might be overwhelming when you start, as you continue to work on assessing things for accessibility, it does get easier. You'll start to, start to um, pick out those images and color issues. Um, the platform, knowing those deficiencies of certain platforms and software, those tendencies for there to be issues will help. Um, and then of course, humans do need to give input on the logical flow of the content and the user experience, right? If you create a giant OER, such as my team seem to like to do, we end up with you know a chemistry OER that is uh, 1,200 pages long in PDF format, that PDF document, that PDF version of the OER uh, is going to be a little problematic for a lot of people. It's big. It's hard to work with. It's hard to open it and keep it where you need it to be. So um, one of our workarounds was to take Adobe Acrobat Pro and split that PDF into chapters, right? So that it's a shorter thing. It's a little bit easier to manage. OK, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a quick screenshot of the WAVE tool. Um, and this is my own, I'm pretty sure this is my own textbook. So, um, oh no, it's running for success in Minnesota. I didn't want to pick on anyone. Um, but you can see here, for example, um, in the center of the page, there's a graphic. And that graphic is a picture of text, like a whole paragraph and a half worth of text. And you can see that they have used um, some red printing in between the lines of the text to indicate their changes. 
the alt text for that particular image just says George's paragraph, right? But there's a whole lot more going on. So I, like I said, I cannot advocate enough for the wave tool. Try it, try it on a few pages and uh, you'll start to get used to it. So it has um, sort of a summary panel on one side and you can click on details and it will start to give you more issues that it found. And then you can start to work through those and assess how many of those are critical um, and what you might do about them. So that's just a brief, brief introduction to the wave tool. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I've given you a slide of resources and further learning. Um, there's a great resource uh, that I think is posted by TMU um, called Professional Web Accessibility Auditing Made Easy. Now you can do a deep dive into this. So much great content here, um, but uh, I like the things to watch for a page. That's kind of the inspiration for my, my themed five. Um, so that's a great place to start. We have Niagara College's Accessibility Hub, which was created uh, with VLS funding a few years ago. It's fantastic. Uh, the WAVE Accessibility Tool is there. And there's also um, some information Kate, enough to check with your college's teaching and learning center and library. So there may be folks in each of these places that, um, that can help you get started. Right. Uh, I know for a fact the college libraries work together collaboratively to assess um, the databases that we purchase. So um, there's there are going to be people and resources on campus that can help you. It's just a matter of figuring out who those are um, and they can help with accessibility training audits and more. You just have to kind of ask them uh, what they can help you with. OK, I think that might be the last slide, Laura. Do you want to just check? OK, slides were created by Slides Carnival. There's my attribution statement. So that is my speed talk on sort of the top five things to look for in OER. And I'm going to flip it over to Laura, if that works. Thanks so much for, for the presentation. Um, Jen had a lot of links that were like amazing resources that were integrated in the slides. We shared out the deck but for anybody who um, wasn't able to catch them, we tried to drop a few in the chat as well. Um, we will be sharing it again um, and with the presentation when it's available on YouTube so that you can uh, check out the resources. Uh, Jen had a lot of great ones. Um, Jen, I wanted to pause and take a moment to thank you for your presentation. Um, I think this was great and so amazingly complimentary to a lot of the presentations that have gone on this week um, and are continuing through. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Sarah, if you have a moment to stop the recording.